Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Integrity Matters by Eternity. My name is Chooks, and with me in the house today is Dr. Guy Curtis of Western Australia. Guy, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, what you do at the University of Western Australia and possibly your um, area of research focus? Sure. So I'm an academic in the School of Psychological Science. I um, have particular interest in academic integrity among the things that I do. So I've been conducting some research on academic integrity dating back um, more than 15 years now. Uh, and it's really become the increasing uh, focus of what I do in research. Um, in addition to that, I am involved in the application of academic integrity and helping others learn about academic integrity. Uh, I'm the chair here of our academic integrity advisory group, uh, and I've been involved in projects for um, tertiary education quality standards agency in uh, developing academic integrity materials and information for academics around Australia. Excellent. Nice to meet you. And um, today we're looking at exploring the, uh, the concept of academic cheating and how we could potentially start investigating or detecting cheating um, amongst our students and um, universities higher learning. Um, so my first question is around the um, the concept of um, the psychology of academic cheating. How do you describe that and what would you say are some causes of um, um, academic cheating among students in universities? Sure, so um, <clears throat> psychology is a really broad subject, but the, the main focus of psychology is human behaviour and mental processes. So if you take something like cheating as an aspect of human behaviour, it's something that people do, sometimes and then our psychologists ask the question why do we do what we do and there can be all sorts of things that factor into um, engaging in a behavior like cheating it can um, be what people think how people feel what their attitudes are and their personality might predispose them to engage in cheating mm. so all sorts of things that we can measure as um, individual differences among people uh, like their personality traits uh, like their, um, uh, what I'm thinking of the word, self-efficacy, um, essentially how they, how good they feel they are at um, doing what they do, uh, in particular in an educational context. Uh, lots of these sorts of things can um, predict engagement in uh, cheating and plagiarism. Uh, I've been uh, doing some work recently looking at personality traits. So there's some um, particular personality traits that we call the dark triad, are associated with bad behaviour, which is uh, Machiavellianism, narcissism and psychopathy. And these are um, personality traits that uh, seem to be better predictors of students engaging in academic misconduct um, than some of the more um, traditional personality traits um, that are more widely known, like conscientiousness and that kind of thing. Uh, with um, emotions like uh, stress, for example, uh, we know negative emotions are associated with engagement in cheating. Uh, so when students are placed under stress, when students are, are feeling uh, vulnerable, um, they can be more susceptible to cheating. So there's so many different uh, things that we can explore. And what we're, we're beginning to look at is how some of these um, factors fit together, not just what individual factors are, are predicting uh, cheating. So that's quite interesting. You, you talk about um, stress, personal stress, and how that affects cheating. Now that we're in, um, we've suddenly pivoted to, um, or with the pivot to remote and hybrid learning, would you say there's been any data that's been shown to prove that there's been an increase or decrease in the level of um, cheating um, in our institutions? Sure. So it, it's a bit hard to pin down because um, with the, the big move to online learning driven by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a lot of the, the data is new and it's hard to compare uh, with um, data historically. Uh, one of the um, studies that has uh, come out recently showed that there was a, a big increase in students using um, essentially homework help type sites that um, can sometimes provide uh, things like an answer to a question that a student has on a test in front of them. Uh, now, students using those sites, they're, they're typically sites that aren't endorsed by um, their higher education institution um, and often using them that way would be considered cheating. Uh, but the, the evidence is that um, students are potentially using those more. 
uh, what I've seen uh, data at least early days on um, post uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, is that there seems to be um, some increases in um, academic misconduct, uh, but, but cheating and plagiarism. Uh, there's all sorts of factors um, driving that. Stress may well be one of them. Uh, certainly the unfamiliarity with the environment, the av availability of help from staff and, and all sorts of things um, could be contributing to it as well. Um, so it sounds like there's, there is there will be that at some point um, down the track, and I'm not sure who's doing research in that field. Um, but now my, my next question is along the lines of thinking about um, proven, um, from your experience, um, proven strategies that can support um, creating that culture of academic integrity within institutions. Um, here at Turnitin, we're very focused on um, promoting products um, that support um, what we term citizens of um, uh, integrity. Uh, so from your experience, what would you say are some proven um, strategies that, um, that have worked in terms of um, fostering the culture of academic integrity? Sure. So um, when, when I think about, you know, what an average student is like and what they, they want to do and at least what they, they tell us they want to do, most people want to do the right thing. Um, in general, most people don't want to come to university and blatantly cheat their way through. But what we, we do find is that um, the new students in particular who are learning rules of um, academic conduct uh, or may have come out of the school experience uh, where they uh, had different expectations around academic uh, conduct, that education is really the most important thing uh, in terms of, say, learning the skills involved in um, properly referencing and citing the sources that they use in, in written work. Now, um, a lot of uh, literature over time has talked about issues like character and being of good character to do the right thing, uh, but you can't be of good character if you don't know how to be of good character. So actually the skills, the skills of referencing are really important. Uh, and certainly the one study I um, was involved in, we looked at a mastery-based task where students get to practice over and over again the skills of referencing. And what we found was not only did that improve their ability to uh, do their, their referencing correctly, but it also improved their attitudes towards academic uh, misconduct. Um, and what that suggests to me is once you know how to do the right thing, you start to perceive that doing the right thing is, is fairly easy and therefore you think, well, everyone should be able to do this. Uh, so really upskilling in education is really very important. Um, beyond that, a, a really big impact on, on any kind of organisation, whether it's universities or anything else, is leadership. Uh, and it's one of my other areas of uh, research interest in, in psychology and academic integrity is leadership. Leaders have a disproportionate influence on the culture of organisations. So if you've got senior leadership support for academic integrity in an institution, uh, then you can um, get that flow-on impact down to um, the academics and the students' uh, emphasising that it's important, that it's something that you should pay attention to and it's something you should know about. Thanks for sharing that. I think you sort of touched on this. Uh, I'm looking along the lines of um, in institutions um, with the potential increase in academic cheating and, and uh, the institutions, what would you say are some practical strategies that academics who might be watching this can take into consideration when um, trying to reduce the prevalence of academic cheating in their institutions? If you want students to uh, complete a test uh, and you want them to complete it individually in a closed book kind of a way, then it's a good idea for them uh, not to have uh, easy access to answers. So um, taking questions from test banks is something that a lot of uh, academics do, test banks that go along with textbooks. Uh, but those te te test banks are very easily accessible um, online for most students. If an instructor can get it, the chances are a student can get it as well. Uh, so um, unsupervised online tests are great if students are practising uh, work over and over again to, to build up their skills. But if they're for marks, um, they're very easy for students to, to cheat to get those marks. Similarly, uh, one of the, the things that's important to uh, whether students cheat or not is whether they're happy with their university course. If they're satisfied with the learning and teaching environment, if they think the 
uh, academic cares, then they're more likely to um, do the right thing. If they think the academic doesn't care, then they may not care so much about doing the right thing. And so um, academics showing that they're putting effort into um, assessments, uh, explaining to students why the assessment um, is there and what it's helping them to learn, making it topical and interesting um, and engaging, showing enthusiasm for the topic, are all good things that academics can do uh, to help uh, students um, engage with the topic themselves and, and be less likely to, to cheat when they're doing that. Uh, but certainly there's um, a lot of uh, things that um, academics and universities can do to dissuade students from um, cheating beyond um, what they're doing educationally. Uh, in, addi in addition, really, the um, having some kind of means of detecting uh, what goes, uh, what um, kinds of cheating students engage in is really important as well. So for something like um, copy-paste plagiarism, text matching software like Turnitin is, of course, ideal because uh, that will um, pick that up for students and ideally used educationally where students can submit in advance um, and get some feedback on whether they've forgotten to include a reference or something like that. It's a really good way to go. Uh, there's also um, some telltale signs of where students have outsourced work, that is, had it written by other people uh, that academics can become familiar with. There are some really good sources of information about what those are. Um, oftentimes, it can be something as simple as looking at the document properties of the Word document students have submitted and seeing that the author is someone other than the student, um, which, which happens from time to time and um, it might be the start of um, having a hint that uh, wasn't really the student who wrote uh, what it is that they submitted. Are there any other telltale signs of academic cheating when um, academics are reviewing submitted um, assessments from students that they should be aware of? Um, and I'm only asking because one of the conversations I've been having in, in prior episodes is one of the, the need to actually make academic integrity someone's job. And I think that's catalytic mm -hmm. from, from memory. Um, so we don't know when we're going to get to that in, 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 in many institutions, uh, making that someone else's job. But for academics who are currently on site, what would you say are some telltale signs of academic um, cheating? Sure. So well, the academic's job in detecting cheating comes at a few levels. So sometimes in a big class, um, you might have uh, tutors and other people who are markers, a unit coordinator above them, and then within an academic organisational unit of some kind, someone who might be involved um, specifically or designated specifically in investigating academic misconduct cases. So really the first step is what markers pick up and markers have to be trained to, to look for telltale signs. Um, the unit coordinators are usually people with a bit more experience and therefore they might have a bit more um, experience in also seeing and judging what might be um, academic misconduct. And then you may have some kind of investigator um, in a role that uh, has more experience still and potentially more training as well in what to look for. So um, often uh, markers will get a really an intuitive sense that something's just not quite right. Like, you know, the, there's, some, there's something in the assignments that um, doesn't seem like what all the other students are writing. So it might be some um, strange references, some references from outside the um, academic area, for example. So uh, for, for us in psychology, if someone's suddenly including a number of references to um, history uh, things, we'd wonder why are you including all these references to history things? And um, particularly if they've, if they've outsourced their work, it could be the case that someone has a bit of familiarity with history. They've just been asked to write a 1,500-word assignment, so they're putting a few things they know in along with the new stuff that they're including to, to meet the uh, guidelines of the assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, the the um, As I said previously, the metadata of a paper, so document properties, uh, what kind of, um, how long was the editing time is an, an interesting thing, for example. A, a document that has a very short editing time is possibly a document that a student has pasted in from another document. Um, a document that uh, has um, an author other than the student is something uh, to be aware of. Uh, the reference list can have some telltale signs of uh, cheating as well. So if um, a student's paper 
uh, has used some kind of reference manager like EndNote or Mendeley or something like that. Um, if they're a first-year student, second-year student, it's quite unlikely they'll know how to use those things, and that, but they're the kind of things that more experienced writers or more senior students might use. And you can um, really, if, in investigating these things, you have to talk to the student and you can ask a student, you know, what referencing software did you use or have you heard of referencing software or um, something like that? And, and if they're unsure about it, um, or I can't show you how they use it, uh, it, it's a telltale sign that someone else has written it. There's there's lots of them. Um, as I said, there's some good sources around the Tertiary Education Quality Standards Agency have um, a, a guide for investigators on their website for detecting um, problematic issues in student assignments, and, and that's well worth a look for people who um, want to look up at least a, a beginning guide to what to look for. Do you feel that we are... Um, equipped and in terms of resources and time to actually um, go deeper in terms of investigation. I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, most universities will have um, marking capped at maybe say two, 20 minutes per student. Mm -hmm. um, but when you start finding all those things, it means there needs to be a level of investigation per student. Um, do you feel that we're better equipped one of the you know, as, as, as institutions to do this better, would you say academics actually carve the time to do this? Yeah, um, one of the, the big impediments to investigating academic misconduct is uh, the time that markers have to mark. So if a, a marker is um, paid a, you know, a rate per hour and that's pretty tight on the amount of words that they have to read, then there's not a great deal of motivation for them to go, oh, this reference looks a bit dodgy. I'll go look up the reference and see whether um, that really is a real paper or whether this paper really said what um, the student is saying that the paper said or whatever it is that they're, they're worried about. So um, those kinds of things that can um, dissuade people from um, investigating, obviously not having the time is a, a big problem. Um, Tracy Bretag, who was at the University of Western Australia, uh, sorry, University of South Australia, and a, a big advocate of academic integrity, uh, often said that institutions have to give their staff enough time to deal with academic integrity issues. For um, people who are in a, some kind of investigator role, uh, that should definitely include some kind of workload time allocation. Uh, I, within my school, I'm the investigator uh, for academic. In conduct uh, problems. Uh, so I get a certain number of sort of hours per year. And what I find is that uh, those hours of work pack into certain times around when assignments are being submitted each semester. Uh, that, you know, for example, we might have um, here 1,600 first year students and we might have 10 of them who get referred to me for um, yeah, further discussion beyond um, problems in their, their referencing. And um, that obviously takes a bit of my time. Uh, we have paperwork and other reporting and, and things like that, but I am given a time allocation to do it. Uh, without that, um, it would be a struggle, of course. So, yeah, staff need the time to do uh, the investigation. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. Um, and I think that's one of the things we need to start thinking more critically about um, at a leadership level at universities is how if we're going to want to uh, combat the academic cheating, we've got to provide the resources to do that. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I think you already started talking about the assessment design aspect in terms of securing um, um, assessment from academic cheating. Um, do you Are there any other strategies in terms of an academic thinking about an, an assessment from conception to its delivery? What are some things that can take into consideration? Um, in that design process? Sure. So um, assessment design has to include, it is really what you're trying to do is get at learning outcomes that you're trying to teach within a unit um, or that you're wanting students to learn within a unit. And I'll particularly say uh, for higher education, it's a co-produced outcome. It's, it's what the teachers teach, but it's also what the students do for themselves. So sometimes um, what you're wanting them to do is go and look up uh, new information, read things um, and get out of that uh, what they they need in order to meet learning outcomes. Now, when you then as a, a marker come to assess that, you need um, some kind of 
grading criteria that also match up to the learning outcomes um, and standards that would indicate what kind of grade against that criteria or what kind of work against that criteria leads to a certain mark. All of that stuff communicated to students in advance seems to be helpful in um, reducing their cheating. So if you've designed your assessment, thought about how you were going to assess it and communicated to the students what the expectations are, that's all a lot easier for them to try to meet what's expected of them and try to follow uh, rules in doing so. There are there certain things in assessment design that can be done um, to reduce the instance of uh, plagiarism, cheating and outsourcing, um, things that can prompt students to do the right thing, things that can give students a, a chance to um, check whether their referencing is right, such as um, putting their papers through, turn it, turn it in advance of, of submission, but also uh, things like um, having a reflective component where they think about how they learnt, for example, or think about what they learnt or um, write about uh, how they could apply what they've learnt in a real-life situation. Those reflective components are great because it's quite hard for, um, for anyone else to do them. Um, consolidating information in your memory, speaking as a psychologist, is, is done much better if you think about how you can apply um, what it is that you know. So uh, those kinds of things are not just assessment designed to combat um, cheating and plagiarism, but just good assessment designed to, to enhance learning um, is really uh, something that academics should be thinking about. I think one other thing that I'm seeing becoming very common is an opportunity to do the Viva kind of exams, a five-minute reflection, talking through your, your thinking process, and I think that really works well. Uh, the only caveat to that is, does the academic have time to deal with 500 students in a class? Yeah. Exam. So that's that's another um, angle we need to look at it. Um, I think you already touched a little bit about um, technology and um, academic cheating. Um, with the current move to um, online assessment, we know that students are doing assessments online and they're doing it via EdTech. Um, what, what role does technology have in supporting that um, level of detection and investigate, investigating contract cheating? Sure. So um, one of the things I've uh, recently been working on was uh, a review of historical trends in um, academic integrity, basically historical trends in the prevalence of students' engagement in plagiarism and cheating. And there's only um, a handful of studies that have given um, similar students similar questions at different points in time um, to see whether the amount of students who are engaging in various kinds of plagiarism and cheating are changing. Um, in the, the last 30 years, so say between about 1990 and, and um, 2020, 2021, uh, what we can see actually across the, the three studies that have tracked things um, in this way uh, is that academic um, integrity breaches, academic um, cheating and plagiarism have trended downwards. Um, it surprises a lot of people. Um, but one of the, the things that fits into that timeline is um, the, the uptake of the internet and um, then um, the uptake of, of text matching software. What I think um, people were worried about with the internet uh, as academics and, and cheating is really students can find anything and then they can copy anything and they can paste anything. Uh, someone very adroitly commented that if students can find it, their markers can find it too. Um, and then a system like um, Turnitin um, will do that with a, a fair degree of automaticity um, that makes it even easier for markers um, and for students to know, for example, when they've um, copied and pasted something and forgot to put a reference on it. So... Um, the, the trend downwards in um, prevalence of plagiarism over time seems to uh, relate very nicely to um, the internet. The, the other thing the internet um, does is it gives you the opportunity to train students um, better in some way. So you can do things like a competency-based task that they, they practice over and over again until they, they get their referencing right. Um, however, uh, the, the pandemic situation um, is a whole nother um, kettle of fish because of uh, the isolation, the stress, uh, the, the disengagement with um, teaching staff, that not only are students um, submitting work online and looking up um, their sources online and um, potentially doing more tests online, uh, but they're also trying to uh, learn from people talking to them online. Uh, 
it's harder. And because of that, because it's harder, um, whether they can keep up with all the uh, requirements of them, including uh, the requirements around academic integrity, is a, a question we don't quite know the answer to yet. Although, so um, I've said earlier, earlier results from studies are showing that um, academic integrity problems may be increasing since the, the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, so we're going to get into a more trickier um, question, which is around um, the the need to investigate and gather evidence that's going to support uh, a, a student's assessment that is involved in um, an academic misconduct case. Um, have you got any, from your experience, well, how would you go about coaching an academic who wants to get better at um, um, gathering this evidence? Um, what often happens with uh, suspected academic misconduct is that it's, it's usually plagiarism. Um, that's, that's typically the most common thing. Um, or it's often collusion, that is, two students in um, the same class having worked together. Um, ideally, having um, a tool like Turnitin, what um, people can do is they can look at uh, the Turnitin report and see uh, what text matches to uh, what other sources uh, or what text matches to other students in the same unit. But um, there are a few little tricks that are worth knowing for, um, for people who are unfamiliar with um, using these systems. So um, you can print out a Turnitin report and that printed out Turnitin report is static and it might show um, a match of a bit of text to a particular source or something like that. But if you go into Turnitin uh, online on a computer, what you can do is turn on and off particular matches. So you can see, for example, whether um, something that looked like it came from two or three sources in the original report might have all just come from one. But what Turnitin has matched one bit to, to one place and one bit to another place. Or you might get a match to um, several students uh, within a unit for one student, and that can often happen if they're writing on the same topic. They might have a few references in common. They might have a cover sheet um, that matches up between all the assignments or something like that. Yeah. Um, you can filter out uh, you know, one student at a time to see which student one has the, the highest level of match to. Uh, and again, that kind of stuff can be helpful. But beyond that, um, it's then really important uh, in a, an investigation process to talk to the students and get their side of the story because often um, you'll find that they have a reasonable explanation for why there's a match um, that uh, to text that's been written by someone else um, and other times they will um, they'll simply say, oh, whoops, yes, no, I should have known better, I, um, I copied this from somewhere. Uh, but you have no idea what their actual situation is until you've talked to them. Um, whether there might have been some mitigating circumstances that you know, might have been unwell, probably should have got an extension but didn't. Um, these kinds of things you just don't know until you've talked to them. Uh, it varies institution by institution. Uh, for, for my institution, academics who want to conduct those kinds of interviews can refer them on to the one person in their school who does that and save themselves the time. And what I'd say for people who are in those um, interviewing roles is to have a standard set of questions um, that you ask all students um, that you can adjust a bit, particularly asking students how they went about um, researching their assignment, how they went about writing their assignment, because sometimes the answers to those can um, really be quite helpful in understanding where they went wrong so that you can help them to do better next time um, as, a, as an educational intervention. But it can also um, lead students to tell you things that don't quite match up with what's in their documents. Um, so it can, to a certain extent, act as a viber um, of, you know, do you actually understand what's in there and why? So I, I had the experience of, of talking to a student one time um, where I said, can you tell me about the, the statistics in your report? And they told me that there were different statistics in there that they, than they'd actually reported. So then I asked them about the, the kinds of statistics that were in their, their submitted report and they weren't familiar with them and couldn't really explain what they were. Um, and that you know, was fairly suggestive to me that they hadn't written that um, or that they had uh, some, some help beyond uh, what they, they really should have. So a, a standard set of um, interviewing questions, um, questions that are relatively open-ended that allow students to um, either uh, um, 
incriminate themselves, lack of a better word, um, or uh, you know, really give you a, a decent explanation for, um, for what's gone on um, that you can verify against other information that you have in, in the text of their assignment. Excellent. I think you just gave me a couple of other thoughts in regards to some things that could also apply to the assessment design phases as well. Is, is that level of educating the students of the need to know, um, to be sure about what they're responding and be able to talk back um, and, uh, and engage in that level of reflective um, work. Um, my final question today is going to just to hear your thoughts about the to topic, um, if you have any other thoughts with regard to the topic at hand today, and most importantly, the need for uh, review of policies, academic um, integrity policies across institutions. Um, how how would you inform that process uh, as an expert in, 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 in this field? Hopefully there's some, some really good resources, uh, particularly developed by, um, by Tracy Bretag uh, from the University of South Australia on um, what makes a good academic integrity policy. Uh, so that kind of information is published online that people can see. Really a good academic integrity policy should be clear and transparent um, to students. Uh, to students about uh, what is expected, what's not expected, clear and transparent to staff about what rules and procedures that they should follow in the case of an academic integrity breach. Uh, it should be um, educative, um, but also should um, deliver consequences. Uh, and it's something that the policy itself um, is a starting point, but it's something that needs to be followed. So whatever's going on with the policy, whether it's enforcing cases of um, academic misconduct or um, monitoring um, what students are, are doing and what kind of breaches of academic conduct are coming up, that kind of stuff should be recorded and reported up through um, university hierarchies, not just, um, it's not enough to just say we have a policy and that, that's good enough. So um, the policy should be a, a living, working document, um, and ideally there should be some involvement in um, of staff and, and experts who deal with academic integrity issues in updating um, policies. Um, keeping them up to date is important because uh, new kinds of problems emerge. Uh, as we've, we've noted in, um, in recent years, uh, things like um, commercial file sharing sites, uh, have uh, capacity for students to upload an assignment they've done and the student somewhere else in the world to download that assignment and, um, and submit it somewhere else. And uh, those kinds of file sharing sites, uh, you know, they potentially have a, a role in um, providing educational information to and for other people, um, but also they um, potentially have a role in, in breaching copyright or in, in, in some cases facilitating um, cheating and plagiarism. Now, um, the university doesn't have a policy about the use of those sites. Uh, it's very hard for them to then say to students, um, you shouldn't have been uploading all your course material to uh, the, these sites when um, there's nothing in the, in the policy that says that that's a problem. So the policies have to keep up to date with, um, with what's going on. That brings us to the end of this very unique um, episode on Integrity Matters by um, Turnitin. We, we've been um, exploring um, the psychology of academic cheating and trying to understand how we go about investigating and detecting cheating in institutions. Um, I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Guy Curtis of the University of Western Australia for being with us today. And um, I hope anyone watching this um, can learn from um, his experience and his expertise um, in how they approach academic cheating at institutions. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.